today. The results of this visit will surely be seen and will surely have a reflection on the battlefield and in liberating our territories. The decision of the United States on Abrams tanks for Ukraine has already uh, presented a foundation for establishing a tank coalition and it's of historic importance in many other aspects, more specifically in air defense, in patriots, for the defense of our cities. Now this is a very fundamental and crucial reinforcement of our capacities. We've also talked about long-range weapons and the weapons that may still be supplied to Ukraine, even though it wasn't supplied uh, before. The, I, I know, Mr. President, that there will be a, a very significant package of security support to Ukraine, and uh, currently it will serve as a clear signal that Russia's attempts of revenge will have no chance, and that we will together defend our cities and citizens from Russia's door will have uh, more impetus uh, towards our victory. And uh, today we have yet again underlined that we have our common vision with regards to the perspectives of this war. We have coordinated the uh, follow-on pressure on the terrorist state. We are working hard on the reinforcement of sanctions, both bilaterally and in the form of G7, which is very important. We have common vision on the contents of many aspects of our peace formula, because uh, it's security elements as well as the tasks to restore the UN Charter to its full capacity and to defend the international rule-based order. That's a common, a joint task for all the countries that are interested in the international security. The rebuilding and the, uh, the recovery of justice is also very important for all those who uh, was affected by the Russian terror, by the Russian war, and the aggressor has to take responsibility for the aggression and to reimburse all the damages. I thank to the President of the United States for supporting our work on restoring the justice, more specifically in the work of our, all of our institutions in that area. And we believe there's no alternatives to the establishment of the special tribunal. This is the position of the United uh, of Ukraine, and we shall support this position. And I would really like the United States to be engaged in the implementation of our peace formula, because its implementation would mean a reinforcement of global stability and the predictability of international relations. And we have some achievements in this area. Already this week in New York, together with the United States of America, and uh, over 60 other countries will be submitting for the consideration of the UN General Assembly of the draft resolution on supporting peace in Ukraine. And on the eve of the 24th of February, we believe that uh, the approval of this resolution would be a very significant evidence to the fact that the terrorist state would never break a civilized uh, country. And uh, I think uh, we are. We are we are also opening a special tablet dedicated to the President Biden. The first call at the night of the 24th of February took place with the United States, and since that time we had uh, conversations and there was very significant attention to uh, our fight to the protection of Ukraine's democracy. Besides, there is the personal contribution in President Biden in solidifying the uh, liberty and democracy in the world. This will, rem will, re will be remembered eternally. And uh, Ukraine is grateful to you, Mr. President, to all the uh, U.S. citizens, to all those who cherish freedom just as we cherish them. Glory to our warriors, glory to our uh, allies, and glory to Ukraine. President of the United States of America. Thank you very much, Mr. President. You know, it was, uh, it was one year ago this week that we spoke on the telephone, Mr. President. It was very late at night in Washington, very early in the morning here in Kyiv. Russian planes were in the air and tanks were rolling across your border. You told me 
that you could hear the explosions in the background. I'll never forget that. And the world was about to change. I remember it vividly. Because I asked you, I asked you next, I asked you, what is there, Mr. President? What can I do for you? How can I be of help? And I don't know if you remember what you said to me, but you said, and I quote, gather the leaders of the world, ask them to support Ukraine. Gather the leaders of the world and ask them to support Ukraine. And you said that you didn't know when we'd be able to speak again. That dark night, one year ago, the world was literally at the time bracing for the fall of Kyiv. Seems like a lot longer ago than a year, but think back to that year. Perhaps even the end of Ukraine. You know, one year later, Kyiv stands and Ukraine stands. Democracy stands. The Americans stand with you and the world stands with you. Kyiv has captured a part of my heart, I must say. I've come here six times as vice president, once as president, and in 2009 as vice president when I first came here. Then back in 2014, I came three times in the aftermath of the Revolution of Dignity. And I again came in 2015 to address the RADA about the work of building a strong democracy. And I came in 2017, just before I left office as vice president. I knew I'd be back, but I wanted to be sure. Even though we, the election were over, Barack and I were out of office, I decided to make one more trip before the next president was sworn in to Kyiv. So, President Zelensky, you deeply honor me here in Kyiv with you today. To meet with your military, your intelligence folks, your diplomatic teams, community leaders who have stepped up and uh, helped their country in their hour of need. It's astounding who stood up. Everybody. Everybody. Women. Young children trying to do something, just trying to do something. Pulling people out of apartments and being shelled and literally, I think, is a war crimes. It's astounding. And the whole world, the whole world sees it and looks at it. This is the largest land war in Europe in three quarters of a century. And you're succeeding against all and every expectation except your own. We have every confidence that you're going to continue to prevail. You know, uh, from the moment I uh, first received an intelligence report in the fall, about a year ago, we were focused on determining how do we rally the rest of the world? How do I help you with the promise you asked me to make to rally the world? Well, how do you succeed? How do you get a world to respond to a prosperous economy, a confident democracy, a secure and independent state? When United Americans of all political backgrounds decided that they would step up. American people know it matters. Unchecked aggression is a threat to all of us. We build a coalition of nations from the Atlantic to the Pacific, NATO to the, in the Atlantic, Japan in the Pacific, I mean, across the, across the world. The number of nations stood up over 50 help Ukraine defend itself with unprecedented military, economic, and humanitarian support. 
We united the leading economies of the world to impose unprecedented costs that are squeezing Russia's economic lifelines. Together, we've committed nearly 700 tanks and thousands of armored vehicles, 1,000 artillery systems, more than 2 million rounds of artillery ammunition, more than 50 advanced launch rocket systems, anti-ship and air defense systems, all defend you to defend Ukraine. And that doesn't count the other half a billion dollars we're going to be we're announcing with you today and tomorrow. That's going to be coming your way. And that's just the United States in this piece. And just today, that announcement includes artillery ammunition for HIMARS and howitzers, more javelins, anti-armor systems, air surveillance radars to help protect Ukrainian people from aerial bombardments. Later this week, we will announce additional sanctions against elites and companies that are trying to evade sanctions and backfill Russia's war machine. And thanks to bipartisan support in Congress, this week we are delivering billions in direct budgetary support, billions in direct budgetary support, which the government can put to use immediately and help provide for basic services of citizens. The cost that Ukraine has had to bear has been extraordinarily high, and the sacrifices have been far too great. They've been met, but they've been far too great. We mourn alongside the families of those who've been lost to the brutal and unjust war. We know that there'll be very difficult days and weeks and years ahead. But Russia's aim was to wipe Ukraine off the map. Putin's war of conquest is failing. Russia's military has lost half its territory it once occupied. Young, talented Russians are fleeing by the tens of thousands, not wanting to come back to Russia. Not, not just fleeing from the military, fleeing from Russia itself, because they see no future in their country. Russia's economy is now a backwater, isolated and struggling. Putin thought Ukraine was weak, and the West was divided. As you know, Mr. President, I said to you in the beginning, he's counting on us not sticking together. He was counting on the inability to keep NATO united. He was counting on us not to be able to bring in others on the side of Ukraine. He thought he could outlast us. I don't think he's thinking that right now. God knows what he's thinking, but I don't think he's thinking that. But he's just been plain wrong. Plain wrong. And one year later, the evidence is right here in this room. We stand here together. Mr. President, I'm delighted to be able to repay your visit to our country. In Washington, not long ago, you told us, you told the Congress, Quote, we have no fear, nor should any in the world have it. End of quote. You and all Ukrainians, Mr. President, remind the world every single day what the meaning of the word courage is. From all sectors of your economy, all walks of all life, it's astounding. Astounding. Remind us that freedom is priceless. It's worth fighting for for as long as it takes. And that's how long we're going to be with you, Mr. President, for as long as it takes. We'll do it. Thank you. States would be walking, as you can see now, through the streets uh, with President Zelensky. Uh, this capital city is still secure and uh, still uh, safe. And Zelensky, uh, President Zelensky, saying this has to end with liberation of all Ukrainian territory, he said in his uh, remarks there. Uh, 
he welcomed the first president, uh, the first visit from the president during the war, uh, a most important visit, he said. And he said, our talks were positive and fruitful, and uh, we're talking about a very significant security package, including long-range weapons, he said. And uh, we will keep the pressure up on what he called the terrorist state. Joe Biden spoke of the dark night, as he described it, a year ago when no one knew what would happen. But he said, a year on, Kyiv stands, uh, Ukraine stands, democracy stands. And he said it was a, an honor to meet uh, President Zelensky in the capital, an honor to meet his military leaders and uh, diplomats. And he said, you are succeeding. I am confident you will prevail. Putin's war of conquest is failing. So uh, let's go over to our security and defence editor, Deborah Haynes, who's also in Kyiv. And Deborah, I guess it's worth making the point, you can't deny the risks involved in Joe Biden coming here like this. Yeah, you can only imagine the headaches and the stress that must have been felt by his security team trying to arrange for this visit. We know for ourselves uh, we felt a bit of that security cordon, didn't we, in the couple of hours before the president came here to St Michael's Monastery where he uh, paid a visit with the Ukrainian president. They cordoned off the whole of this area. Um, even not letting us out of um, the hotel where we're staying during the time that the president was on the ground and across the capital, people commenting that the whole area, the whole capital central had been locked down while the motorcade came in. It must have been incredibly nerve wracking because the only way into this country at the moment is by road. You can't just fly in quickly and fly out. And so they would have been very mindful of the fact that this is a place where Russian missiles do fall. And as you said, there was an air raid siren that went off, which does happen quite regularly while the president was on the ground. Um, but what must President Putin be thinking as he looks at the scenes in the capital of Ukraine today. It was his ambition a year ago when he launched this invasion to topple the Ukrainian government and to install a pro-Moscow regime. Instead, the Ukrainian president is still in power. And not only that, the US president has chosen to come and pay a visit. That can't be going down very well in the Kremlin. Deborah, thank you very much indeed. Just a quick word, if we can, before the top of the hour with the Ukrainian MP, Kira Rudik. Um, and I just wonder what you make of these scenes in your capital city today. Uh, we are, of course, delighted. And this visit is a great symbol for all Ukrainians. I want to remind everybody that the war didn't start a year ago. It started on this day, nine years ago. And this is why it is so important for us to see that the world knows, remembers, stands with Ukraine, and that we are all aligned on one mission, for us to win the war and live in victorious and peaceful Ukraine. And what would your message be to President Biden? What do you think uh, President Zelensky's message was to President Biden? Uh, well, my own message would be uh, a year from school, full scale invasion. We are running on one fuel. This fuel is hope. Thank you so much for adding to our ability to stand, fight and hope for the best for our country. For that, we need air defense systems, we need more weapons, and we of course need fighter jets to protect our skies. I think it was very personal for President Biden to be under air raid sirens today because there were a threat of the attack um, just uh, an hour when he was in Ukraine. And uh, so, so we can tell our people that they should not be afraid, that we can protect them, we do need the fighter jets. Um, the reality is, though, that the war goes on and Russia is talking about this new offensive. They are not going to uh, give up. How do you see the next few months? We are fighting for our motherland. We are not giving up 100%. And this is why we are going to use all the matters that are in our hands 
all the help, all the support to uh, to win and to kick them away from our territory, from uh, our cities, and make sure that uh, we figure out how to do so they cannot attack us again. So the next months will be tough. We know that. But what is our alternative? There is no alternative. And uh, looking ahead, you know, it's clear that this could be a long war. Is Ukraine prepared for, you know, a long war? And more pertinently, do you think that the West is prepared to continue this help for, for the long haul? Well, the desire of a long war, it's Putin's plan. He wants to drag everybody into a long war, uh, hoping that the unity will not stand. President Zelensky said that we are fighting for a quick war. So we need to be able to uh, finish it as soon as possible. And this is why we are calling for everybody to mobilize their support, to make the decisions that were probably postponed, but to make them now so that we can get uh, all the means that we need to fight back. We are ready to fight. Our men and women are ready to fight, and we know that we are fighting for every single day. So for that, we need the weapons. So if we receive enough of the weapons, we do not see why it should be a long war. Okay, Kira Rudik, uh, appreciate your time. Uh, we're coming to the top of the hour. Thank you very much indeed. So there we are. These are extraordinary images from Kyiv. Uh, President Joe Biden on an historic visit to this capital city. This is Sky News today. It's 11 o'clock in the UK, 1 p.m. here in Kyiv. The headlines. President Biden makes an unexpected visit to the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv. He's met President Zelensky, who said the visit is an extremely important sign of support for all Ukrainians.